could it be? Me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to my draft 101 live series where we break down each and every single position in the National Football League's upcoming 2020 NFL draft. Tonight, we're talking two positions. In particular, we're talking about the tight end position and the offensive tackle position. Uh, the tackles are going to come off the board very quickly, as they always do. This is a unique draft in the sense that there are a lot of good quality tackles. I've actually got four first round grades on tackles. And then I think in the second round, I've got another four or five grades on tackles there as well. So uh, you're you're going to see the in, in the second round tackles, two or three of them probably going to get pushed up into the first round, fringe first round, early second. So you're going to see these guys come off the board very rapidly. I wouldn't be shocked to see five tackles come off the board in the first round. You know how the tackles usually are. You know, get them while they're available and while supplies last. So, you know, tackles go quickly. Quarterbacks go quickly, uh, at least the good ones. And then you start to see um, the other guys kind of flatten out as the rest of the draft takes place. So, um, tight end. Not as not as top heavy as tackle and and quarterback and some of the other positions. This isn't like last year's draft. I was so in love with the tight end position last year. I thought there were you know three or four guys that could go in the first, and another you know four or five guys that could go in the second, and then there were some really good value picks in the third and the fourth round last year, and some teams I contend got some really good tight ends. And I think when we look back at the 2019. NFL draft at the tight end position, we're going to say, man, what was that a hell of a class for tight ends or what? We, we saw what Noah Fant did at the end of the year last year for Denver. Um, I, I, I still believe that um, the Iowa tight end last year that went number seven overall to Detroit is going to end up being really good for them. Um, but both of the I Iowa boys went in the first round relatively early at that. And then um, I, I, I contend that uh, Foster Moreau in Oakland, and I, you remember that was the guy I was beating the table for last year. Uh, he had a, a hell of a rookie season for the Raiders. They're excited about him. Um, and, and all of the other guys, I still think in Green Bay, um, they got the Texas A&M tight end, and I was excited about him last year. Got limited reps. think you're going to see him ball out. Um, you knew I, another guy that I was high on was the um, tight end out of uh, Mississippi State. And he balled in in in, in uh, Buffalo last year, so plenty of tight ends. That's not this group of tight ends this year. However, upon further review, this is actually a tight end class with a little bit of talent. I, I must say, after watching, it's not as dire and 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 full of despair as I thought initially going in. Uh, but I still contend there aren't any first round tight ends. I, I hold st steadfast to that. I don't think there's a tight end in this group that belongs in the first round and I'll take it a step further I don't anticipate a team pulling the trigger on any tight end in the first round I don't think the pop gets topped or excuse me the top gets popped on the tight end position until the second but once one goes I think you could easily see two three four go in the second round or if one comes off the board finally late second you could see four or five come off the board rapid succession into the third round so It'll be interesting to see, uh, to me, where the tight end value is in this draft is in the mid-rounds, third, fourth, and fifth round. I think that's where the best value is. But I think if you're looking for one of the better tight ends in this draft, obviously you're probably going to have to spend either a second or an early third round pick to get one of those guys. We'll talk about the ones that I think have the most potential. There's one in particular that I am salivating over. Uh, we'll talk about him and what his game looks like and how it kind of... Uh, how it kind of transitions to the next level and what I think he could potentially be. And uh, we'll talk about these tackles, man. A lot to get to tonight, uh, so I don't want to delay. Had some uh, technical difficulties earlier. Thank you for bearing with me there. Hopefully those are behind us the remainder of the night. But um, let's uh, start off the show as I often do with these um, by um, giving you my rankings and uh, giving you a quick brief um, reason as to why these players are where they are in the ranking. So uh, we'll start with the tight end position. And 
Uh, my number one tight end is Adam uh, Troutman out of Dayton. Small school guy, obviously, so he's going to have to prove it. The 4-8-40 um, isn't as impressive. He looked like he played faster, but again, he's playing at Dayton. So um, when you're playing against Drake and, and teams like that, it's hard to really know exactly how fast the guy really is running or how fast he really is. So um, that notwithstanding... This is a guy that put up huge numbers, which you are supposed to do uh, at, at Dayton. All right, dominate the competition. And um, I look at this guy, a lot of really good stuff here. He competes in the run game as a blocker. None of these guys are finished products as blockers. But it, there are some that choose to block and there are others that are uh, non-participants. He's a guy that actually tries to block and actually gives good effort. And he can catch the football. Um, I got a player comp of him to me. His ceiling is Travis Kelsey. All right, he's got that kind of size, that kind of ability. His floor to me is Austin Hooper. So to me, you're probably getting a really quality NFL starting tight end. Uh, on, the, on the high side, you could be talking about one of the elite tight ends in the league. On the low side, you're talking about a very productive tight end that can catch you anywhere from 60 to 80 balls and, you know, in zone coverage, do some damage, and every now and again separate from man-to-man. -man. But uh, Adam Troutman, to me, is a guy that you can win with in this league. He's my number one tight end uh, this year. Coming in at number two is my favorite tight end in this draft. Um, this is a guy that someone had mentioned him to me about three weeks ago or so on a Redskins show, asked me about him. I had no, no idea who he was, hadn't, hadn't looked at any of the tight ends really, to that point and so um this is a guy that I, i've i've fallen in love with his game and, and devin asiasi out of eucla uh, this is a guy here that has the traits of a big time pass catching tight end but not only does he catch it he competes in the run game as a blocker i i think he can do it all man and he's got the ability to run away from defenders you go watch him versus usc and he catches a slant and he just murks I mean, he just takes off and runs away from every defender. And it's it's not like they were playing against the Little Sisters of the Poor, all right? They weren't playing against Belmont. They were playing against USC, and he ran right past those guys. So um, he's got a little bit of giddy-up and go to him, a little bit of a burst. Um, my comp for him, for some Redskins fans, they might want to cover their ears, but he was talented. He just smoked his way out of the league. It was Fred Davis. And, and I see a lot of Fred Davis in him. Similar size, similar um, st stature, similar athleticism. Really like Devin Asiasi, man. This guy's talented. He's my number two tight end in this draft. Uh, then you get to my third tight end, and it's Cole Komet out of Notre Dame. And I know a lot of people like him as their number one tight end in this draft. And he's really talented. And I'm a Notre Dame Fighting Irish fan, and I, I love Cole Komet. I think he's a really talented guy. You want to know what he brings to the table? Turn on the Georgia game. In the biggest game of the Notre Dame season, he played his best game. Now, it happened to be his first game of the season because he missed the first few games of the season with an injury. But he came out guns a-blazing, put up his best effort of his career, really. But to save his best effort against the best competition says a lot about Cole Komet. My biggest problem with him is... It, he's got the size, he's got the pass catching ability, he's got the speed, he's got everything you need to be an elite tight end. He just doesn't block. And that's always been my problem with him. You know, watching him at Notre Dame, he just doesn't block. There's not enough effort there. He, he's just a, a guy that doesn't want really anything to do with the run game. And so that's why he can't be number one for me. He's number three, as a matter of fact, with my tight ends. Now, if he learns how to block, if he can just give me something, he could easily be the best tight end. And I'll be honest with you, either one of those tight ends that I just named, it wouldn't shock me if either one of those guys were first off the board. Um, I think those are the only three, though, that have a legitimate shot at being your first tight ends off the board, if you ask me. I don't think any of these other guys are going to be your first tight end off the board. But uh, it wouldn't shock me if this next guy, number four on my list, Harrison Bryant. There are too many Bryants in this draft. Harrison, Her you know, too many Bryants, too many H's, too many of these damn Bryants. But Harrison Bryant out of Florida Atlantic is a guy that he can just flat out make plays, uh, caught a ton of balls at Florida Atlantic. But for all the catches, there are a number of drops in there that make it uncomfortable for a guy that his M.O. is catching the football. Now, again, to me, uh, he competes as a blocker, so I don't have a problem with that. He's got some work to do, as all these guys 
have work to do as blockers, but he is willing to at least put forth the effort, but um, he's a ta detached from the line a ton. So I think there's a lot of work you're going to have to do with him putting his hand in the dirt in a traditional Y uh, lineup for uh, Harrison Bryant. But uh, if you're talking about a guy that can run routes, sell fakes, get open, catch the football, make plays, Harrison Bryant is the man for the job. He's my number four tight end in this draft. Number five is another guy that can catch the football um, in Hunter Bryant. I told you there's a lot of these Bryants and these Hunters and these guys that have names that are very similar. Um, he's the, the tight end out of Washington. Uh, a pass catching threat, a guy that has a lot of talent. Um, and, and I see him a as a guy that can do a lot of things on the field, but he again is another one of these guys really not interested in blocking anybody. And so if you're looking strictly for a pass catching threat to come in and, and help you right now, he's a guy that can do that. But if you're looking for an all around tight end, a guy that's going to block as well, he's not the man for the job. You know, I First guy that came to mind when I looked at him was Jordan Reed because he's got that kind of potential, uh, but he doesn't block. And Jordan Reed wasn't much of a blocker either, but he's not as athletically gifted as Jordan Reed. So I couldn't give him that comp. I comped him to Dwayne Allen, the ex Clemson Tiger that ended up being drafted in the second round by the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, but this is a guy that can catch the football. He can make plays. He's athletically gifted. And um, I think if he's able to be coached up, and give you something as a blocker. This guy could have something too. Doesn't have the kind of size you're looking for. He's not 6'5". He's not 6'6". But he can still separate and do some things in the pass game. Um, my number six tight end is Colby Parkinson out of Stanford. Here's a guy that has the size that I was just talking about. Hunter Bryant lacking. He has all of it at 6'7". Um, and, and, and the kind of... Um, target that you're looking for for a QB. If you want to throw the ball up high, he can go and get it, that sort of thing. Red zone type of target. Uh, does a lot of good things in the pass game. Can find the zone, sit down. The, to me, he's got the most reliable set of hands in this draft. Him and, and Devin Asiasi, I think, are the two guys that I trust with my life in terms of them catching the football. Uh, you see a lot of drops from a lot of these guys. Uh, even the guys that had high production numbers, you still saw drops. He wasn't one of those guys. Rarely does he drop the football. So um, there was one game in 2018 versus Oregon State where this guy had four touchdown grabs in one half. Just to give you a little bit of what this guy can bring to the table. As I said, 6'7", big time red zone target. The big problem with him, he's not the quintessential Stanford tight end. And what I mean by that is most of the Stanford tight ends come in the league and they can block. Similar to the Iowa offensive linemen, you expect them to be physical and nasty road graders. That's what you expect from Stanford tight ends, that they'll be able to catch it, but they'll also be able to block. Eh, not so much with Kobe Parkinson, and that's why he's a little bit further down my list at number six. And my final tight end, um, rounding out my num uh, group at number seven, is Albert uh, Okuwe Boonham out of Missouri, or Albert O for short. Uh, this is a guy that, you know, two years ago, last year, you would have asked me, I would have thought he would have been the number one tight end in this draft. But, you know, upon further review, there are a lot of holes in his game. But um, this is a guy that I think has some talent. And we also we saw the 4-4-9 at the combine, so we know this guy can run. And um, th there's a lot here with him. He's got some size to him. He's got a lot of things, but he's not a, a big route runner. He relies a lot on his athleticism. And so there's a lot of things he's going to have to clean up. He's going to have to be better as a blocker as well. So um, not as gifted as a route runner as a lot of these other guys that I've mentioned. But um, he's a guy that has some workable tools. So um, like him as my number seven uh, tight end in this draft. So you go from the tight ends and now we transition to the tackles. And I'll give you my top seven tackles. Uh, you've probably seen seen them scrolling across the top of the so we don't generally get six seven three and it's 364 is probably generous he's probably like 370 but um you, you don't get six seven three sixty very often that can move like this guy can we we were all amazed at what he put forth at the combine but it translates onto the field he's not one of these workout warriors he actually translates this to the field and uh, much like orlando brown once upon a time you know zeus 
um, or the, the um, Oklahoma, uh, his son that we saw that everyone trashed, including myself. I'm guilty as charged. I trashed him. He had a horrible combine, and we thought, oh, my God, this guy can't play. And he gets into the league, and he dominates in his rookie season for the Baltimore Ravens as a third-round pick. And you look at um, Trent Brown, a guy that was massive coming out of Florida, drafted by the 49ers, goes to Oakland um, after blowing up in New England and uh, gets the big deal to go to the Raiders to be their uh, tackle. And these guys generally don't miss. They get in the league. If they're willing to work and, and they, they don't eat themselves out of the league, these guys generally work in the league. And he's one of those guys that if he gets his hands on you, it's done. You're finished. Okay. There's nothing else to talk about. If Makai Becton lays hands on you, you're finished. You've got to defeat him at the very beginning of the play or you don't have a chance. And even if you beat him, he's so long, pause, and so big that it's hard to get around him. Even if you do win initially, you've got to slap his hands down and force him to be off balance in order to escape. But uh, that's why he's my number one tackle, man. There's just too much there to, to, to like. Uh, number two is Dredrick Wills Jr. out of Alabama, a guy that had, to me, the biggest riser of this draft is Jedrick Wills Jr. Uh, when we started this process, he wasn't even on the radar. You know, uh, we were talking about all kinds of guys. Hell, his teammate Alex Leatherwood, who went back to Alabama, was probably highly, more highly regarded initially in the process. And as he went back to school and people started focusing in on Alabama, whether you were watching Jerry Judy or you were watching Tua or whatever you were doing, um, this is a guy that stood out to people and, and they started to realize this guy's goddamn talented. And all of a sudden, he started to raise and rise and rise. And now all of a sudden, he may be the first tackle off the board for me. I take Be Becton over him, but not by much. This guy's so smooth. And my one big takeaway from him is that he makes everyone play at his pace. You never see this guy in a panic. You know, some guys, they come out of their stance like a bat out of hell because they know they've got to come out of the blocks clean and fast in order to keep up with some of these speed rushers. This guy, his, his speed is monotone. Every time it looks the same, you're not getting by this guy. Um, he's a machine. He's a technician. Uh, Jedrick Wills Jr. for me is my second tackle in this draft. Uh, and, and the next guy is the one that we thought was going to be the number one tackle. And, and I told you guys at least a month and a half ago, way back when this whole process first started, I said, he's not going to be a, a top five pick. He's not going to even be in the top 10. I told you guys that when that wasn't even a popular narrative and take, I gave you guys that take. I said, Andrew Thomas is not going to be a top 10 pick. And a lot of you scoffed at me, but now that you look, and there are other guys ahead of him, it, it's more likely than not he's not a top 10 pick in this draft. He's my number three tackle. And let me say this. He's a damn good football player, number one. And number two, if this is any other tackle draft outside of 2014, I believe it was, or with Taylor Lewan and Matthews and all of those guys, outside of that draft in the last five to six years, this guy's your number one tackle in the draft, all right? He's that good. But because he's in a draft with other guys that are really good, he's number three. But don't get it twisted. Andrew Thomas is a really good football player. He's got everything you're looking for, the size, the arm length. Uh, he's got the athleticism. He's got the complete package, man. He's a really good football player, and he checks in at number three for me on my list of tackles. Number four for me is Tristan Wirfs out of Iowa. And I talked about um, Kobe Parkinson at the tight end position not being your standard uh, Stanford tight end, a guy that's going to block in the run game but also catch the football. He's just more of a pass catcher. Tristan Wirfs for me, not that mean streak, uh, physical role grading offensive lineman we've come to know and love from Iowa that Kirk Ferentz produces, like a Brandon Sheriff or a Robert Gallery, the guys that come out and they're just nasty and you're like, man, these guys are vicious. That's not Tristan Wirfs. He's more of a technician. He's more of an, a maestro, but he's also a little raw and rough around the edges. He's got some work to do, but man, is he athletically gifted. We saw it at the combine. You see it on tape. There's a lot to like here, but there's also a lot of work to be done. I actually have him 
as a late first round to early second round prospect, he's going to go in the first round, okay? But, um, you know, if I were a team, I'd really be looking at him as more of a second round, top of the second round type of draft pick. But he's going to go in the first round. I've got a late first round to early second round grade on him. He's going to go in the first. He's my number four tackle. My number five tackle is Josh Jones out of Houston. Uh, this guy's an impressive uh, physical specimen as well. Um, he's got really good size. Um, got some really good movement skills, climbs to the second level effortlessly. I mean, he's one of those guys that you throw a screen and you look up and 37 yards down the field is Josh Jones leading the way, looking to maul a safety to, to, to send off that running back uh, into the end zone on, on that, that last final block that he needs to get him there. Uh, this is a guy that does a lot of good things. He's a little raw um, in, uh, in certain areas. Uh, he doesn't generate a ton of movement in the running game, but he does get in the way. He does wall off defenders from the running back, but um, he's got some inconsistencies in his game, doesn't bend his knees, things like that, that you know will sometimes get you into trouble. But all in all, another impressive prospect. Got a second round grade on him. He's not my number five tackle and expect him to go in the first round as well. Uh, that's probably the extent of the first round tackles. You could see one more gu uh, guy sneak into the first round, but I I'd say those five, I'm I feel comfortable saying they're probably going to end up being first round picks. When you get to my number six tackle, it's Ezra Cleveland. This is the guy that I want the Redskins to select uh, out of Boise State. I hope that he's still there. Most likely, he's not going to be there. And I've set my sights on another guy, but this is a guy that I think he, he could easily fall to the third round. It, it's not a foregone conclusion that he's a second round pick, but it all depends on how many of these tackles come off the board in the first round because then teams get desperate and a guy like Ezra Cleveland is going to be the beneficiary of that. Uh, but this is a guy, 6'6", um, showed the athleticism at the combine running a sub-540, uh, and you see it on tape, another one of these guys. One of my issues with him, and look, you don't have to be mean. You don't have to have a nasty disposition to be a really good player in this league. He's just one of these guys uh, that's, he's just a nice guy, man, on the football field, not really looking to, to, to pancake you, not really looking to put your dick in the dirt, per se, as a wise man once told me. He's just looking to get his job done, and he does it really well. I think he fits more in a zone run blocking scheme than he does in a man blocking scheme, but that's not to say he can't do it. I just would hate to see his athletic exploits and talents wasted just blocking in a man system where he could actually get out, get to that reach block, um, and really get to the second level, get to that backer. I'd like to see him in a zone run blocking scheme, but I like Ezra Cleveland. Uh, he mirrors well. He does a lot of good things. He's my number six tackle in this draft. And then finding number seven is Austin Jackson. USC tackle. We all heard the story about him uh, giving bone marrow to his sister over the summer and still being ready to play when the season started. A remarkable story there. Um, this is a guy that I've got a second round grade on here as well. Um, he's an athletically gifted guy, much like Ezra Cleveland. Not a ma not really a, a nasty streak in him. Not a mean spirited bone in his body. He's a good dude, uh, but doesn't stop him from doing his job. Now, there are a lot of holes in his game. But there's also a lot to work with here. And that's why I think uh, you take a Austin Jackson. It wouldn't shock me to see him be the last tackle taken in the first round, which would bring the total most likely to six. Uh, I think he's more of a second round tackle, though. And um, you're going to have to do some work with Austin Jackson. He's nowhere near a finished product. But uh, he's definitely a guy worth taking early and working with him. And I think he's got starting caliber traits um, that will probably shine through eventually in this league. And so those are my top seven tackles. There are many other guys that we can discuss throughout the course of the night. Looking forward to doing that with you guys. Um, but let's get to the comment section. Before we start, um, let me go ahead and ask you to like the video. Subscribe to the Louis T Network for more great content if you haven't already done so. Um, and uh, there are several different ways to communicate with the show. Obviously, Super Chats are number one. All right, so Super Chats supersede everything else. Those come first. You want your voice to be heard immediately. Super Chat is the way to have that done. Number two is to call in. Uh, the phone number is at the top of the screen. There it is. Uh, so phone lines are open. So if we have no Super Chats, 
phone lines will be the next mode of communication. And so make sure that uh, you have your monitor turned down in the background that you're watching this on. Uh, make sure that you have a solid connection. Make sure the volume on your device is turned all the way up so that we can hear you. Speak clearly, concisely, state your point, and get in and get out. I say that every show, and then I end up having a seven-minute conversation with somebody. I'm going to try to be better about that. But if, if that person's talking some good stuff, I'm willing to sit here and listen. If you're not, I'm going to cut you off, and we're going to move on to the next person. So... Phone lines are your second way to communicate. And then finally, your last mode of communication is the comment section. Use the hashtag Louis T Live to have your comment read on the air. That's a comment um, that I will get to. If we have no super chats, we have no phone calls, we will get to your comments. Use the hashtag Louis T Live to have your comment read on the air. So with all of that house cleaning taken care of, Let's get down to business, and we start the night um, with our first super chat of the night from my man, JP, John Perez. What's going on, JP? Thank you for the super chat, my man, JP writes. I'd love to get Albert O in round three or Moss in round four. Um, I think both of those guys will be available in each of those rounds. It wouldn't shock me if Albert O is still available in the fourth round. Um, I think he'll be there. I think Moss, I know Moss will be there in the fourth round. Uh, unless someone gets antsy and jumps up and snatches him in the third round, which I don't see happening. There are too many tight ends that I think are better than him from a physical standpoint. Um, now, he blocks. Remember, I said this because I hadn't watched. All right. I just knew about, you know, I hadn't sat down and analyzed the tape. So, you know, I, I remember him stepping to the podium pre-combine you know, and talking about how he loved to block and it was a big part of his game. And I said, whatever, man. They split you out at, at LSU 85% of the time. What are you talking about? Well, I went back and watched and he actually blocks, man. <laughs> He's one of the better, more physical point of attack blockers in this entire draft. Like, He's not afraid to stick his nose in there, man. Actually, it's pretty damn impressive. So the thing that's going to hold him back He's got, and, and to me, let me let me walk back a statement I made earlier. I said that Colby Parkinson had the best hands and, and Devin Asiasi. I'm going to go ahead and put um, Thaddeus Moss ahead of both of those guys. He's got the best set of hands in this draft. It's not even close. I, I, so I'm going to walk back that statement I made earlier. Thaddeus Moss's hands are A1 official, just like his dad's. Then you get to Colby Parkinson, then Devin Asiasi. So I think that's, how the hand situation goes in this particular draft at the tight end position. Uh, so he's got the upper hand there, but where he's lacking is in the athleticism department. He's not a great athlete, and I think that's what's going to kill people. It would have been nice if he would have been able to run. He chose not to run at the combine, and I think I know why he didn't run. He didn't run because he knew he was going to run a slow time. And he may have been nursing an injury. He tried to cover it up with some kind of injury. I don't think he was really hurt. Just think he didn't want to run. I think he wanted to run at his pro day. That didn't happen, obviously, because of the Rona. But um, I think that's what hurts him. I've got him in my notes pegged at a 474 to a 482, anywhere in that general vicinity. Uh, and, and, you know, a 474 wouldn't be the worst. Honestly, that would put him right in the range with everybody else. What I'm afraid of is that he's going to be a 481. And that's going to turn some people off to him because he's not a big guy. So um, if you're you're running a 4-8 and you're not a big guy, how is it that you separate? It's going to be tough for him to separate at the next level. So he does run some good routes. But I think either one of those guys are, are going to be around in those rounds that you specified. Albert O definitely going to be on the board in the third round. And Thaddeus Moss, to me, definitely going to be available in the fourth round as well. Uh, thank you for the Super Chat, JP. Um, Orlando McManus, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate it, Orlando. Uh, JP says, uh, uh, JP, thank you for the super chat. Uh, double up, uh, uh, for my man JP, doubling up early on in the process. Thank you for the super chats. JP writes, why is Andrew Thomas dropping down draft boards? It's not so much dropping down draft boards as much as it is, we just found other guys that are better, period. That's all it is. It's not an indictment on him. It's just that, hey, we found better guys. You know, it's it's just like you going 
to, um, you know, Foot Locker and you pick up a pair of kicks and you're like, man, I, I like these right here. And you're, you're prepared to purchase these and you just keep walking around the store and you see um, another pair of kicks that you like much better and they're the same exact price or maybe even a little less. And you're like, hmm, why get these when I can get those? So it, it's just one of those situations where you look at Andrew Thomas and you're like, he's a really good football player, but Jedrick Wills is better. Now, is J Jedrick Wills a right tackle? Or a left tackle. He played right tackle at Alabama, which was their blind side. So he was essentially, in effect, playing the most important position along the offensive line because Tua was a left-handed or is a left-handed quarterback. So you could argue at the next level, is the value still the same when you're talking left versus right? Because is, is he going to be able to flip over to the left side? I don't know. I just know from a technical standpoint, he's much better than that of Andrew Thomas. And so I don't think anyone's disappointed in Andrew Thomas or, you know, getting to a point where we're like, man, we overrated him. We overvalued him. We just found guys that are better. That's all. And then when you look at the other positions, you know, because Andrew Thomas started out this process as a top five guy. And then you started looking and then Simmons jumps on board and then people started to wake up to uh, Brown at Auburn. And then all of a sudden you look around and we, we knew Chase Young and we knew Joe uh, Burrow were, were going to be early in the draft. But then you start entering the Justin Herberts of the world and all these other names that start flying up draft boards. And you start looking up around and, and Makai Beckman does what he does at the combine. And you watch the tape and you say, man, this guy's impressive. And, and, and then Tristan uh, or um, Dredrick Wills. And then you start looking around and, and like I said, the receivers. And there's just a number of different guys that you feel like offer you more value than Andrew Thomas, but don't get it twisted. He's a good football player and he's going to fall to someone and they're going to get a really good football player because as I mentioned at the top of this show, in any other draft outside of the 2014 draft where it was tackle crazy, he's probably your number one tackle in the last five, six years. He's that good. But this draft is unique because the tackle position is so deep and so rich with talent that I can find a couple of other guys better than him and that's saying a lot because he's a really good tackle. So thank you for the super chat, uh, JP. Um, greatly appreciate that. Um, let's see. Got another super chat. This one from Samer L. D. My man, Samer L. D. Hebe. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Sorry if I uh, butchered your name, Samer. Greatly appreciate the super chat, however. My man, Samer writes uh hey louie been following your great content for a few years thanks for all the hard work any idea who could replace yonda for my ravens tough task that is a very very tough task um you're asking to replace a hall of famer and um th there are going to be some guys in this draft um that come along that are going to be able to do some things and let me pull up my list of guards um, in this draft, there's one guy that right now is being looked at as a tackle, but I think he ultimately uh, screams guard to me, and he's a mauler. He kind of fits in that mold of Baltimore Ravens um, physicality, and um, his name is Robert Hunt, played at Louisiana Lafayette. Shorter arms uh, than I would like at the tackle position, and you see it on tape sometimes with his hand placement and things. He's very raw but he's physically gifted, and um, I feel like he's got the uh, ability to kick inside the guard. I actually think guard is going to be uh, the better position for him at the next level. That's the kind of guy that if I'm the Ravens, I'm targeting because it, you're not going to have to go and draft him in the first or the second round. Robert Hunt is going to be around in the third, fourth, you know, possibly the fifth round, depending on, you know, who you ask. Again, someone else may evaluate him as a tackle and wants to give him an opportunity to play tackle. But if you're talking about, from a guard standpoint, kicking him inside, uh, he's really interesting to me. And he's a guy that I think you could easily kick inside uh, to guard. And I think he would make a seamless transition there. And he actually played guard at Louisiana Lafayette, too. He, he, he played all over the offensive line, right guard, right tackle, and um, left tackle, but primarily he was a right tackle at um, Louisiana Lafayette, but he did play some right guard as well. So he's not foreign to the position. 
Um, there are a few names that jump out at the guard position. Um, uh, one of my favorites in this particular draft is Tyree Phillips out of Mississippi State. Um, that's a guy that is definitely in that mold of a Baltimore Raven. Damian Lewis out of LSU is another guy that you look at. Anybody on that LSU line from this past year uh, is pretty much gold right now. I mean, uh, you talk about Quisenberry, talk about Damian Lewis. Um, you talk about um, uh, the uh, left tackle. Oh, man. Um, forgot his dang old name. Uh, Charles... Charles, Sadiq Charles. Um, that line was loaded at LSU. Uh, same with Georgia. They got a couple of guys in the draft. So um, there are a number of guys that can give you some value at the guard position. But I think Robert Hunt is a guy that I'm interested in that, that converted, uh, that is a tackle right now, but I think probably projects better at the next level as a guard. Um, and I think he would be able to come in. And he's a mauler, man. He's physical. I, I I call him IHOP. You know, international hunt of pancakes, okay? This is a guy that you watch him, and he's just slamming dudes on the ground and plopping on top of them, belly-to-belly -belly suplexes. Like, this guy is physical, man. So that's the kind of guy. I, when I think of the Ravens and their offensive line, he's the kind of guy that I'm thinking of. And so that's the guy that I would um, uh, recommend for the Ravens in the draft. So... Thank you for the super chat, uh, Samer. Greatly appreciate it. Um, Barrett Downing, my man BD, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate the super chat, BD. As always, my man Barrett Downing writes, always a great show. Keep it up. Thank you for the support. As always, BD, like I said, you always look out for uh, the Louis T Network. And so I greatly appreciate that. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, Tristan and... Uh, I uh, blah, 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 blah. Tristan, thank you for the super chat. I, I always uh, try my hardest to jack up your name. Uh, so we're just going to go with Tristan. Okay. Thank you for the super chat, Tristan. Uh, greatly appreciate it. My man, Tristan writes, um, which team do you consider Williams most likely to Williams as in Trent? I'm uh, assuming, but uh, what Williams are you referring to? Uh, put it in the comment section so I can uh, further elaborate on your super chat. Um, so you said a 50 letter limit on super chat. Wanted to say how much I love your show. I appreciate that, Tristan. Um, which Williams are you referring to? Go ahead and put it in the comment section. Um, you said it's a name from Arthur, uh, Arthurian Legends. You got me. I have no idea what you're referring to. <laughs> so <laughs> that's probably why I don't know it. Trent. Okay, so Trent Williams. You know what? It's really hard to say, man. I, I've, I've talked about this ad nauseum. And I, and I said this, that it, it wouldn't shock me that the team he ultimately goes to isn't a team that we're thinking about, you know, right off the cuff. You know, early in the process, you know, we, we talked Houston. We talked Arizona. We talked Jets. We talked Dolphins. Um, I don't know if it's going to be any of those teams, honestly speaking, you know, uh, it could be Minnesota. And remember, I think the team that probably makes the most sense is the Vikings, because I, I still contend that wherever Trent goes, it's going to have to be to a team that feels like they're in win now mode. But at the same time, the Vikings don't have any money to to give Trent a new contract. So I don't know if that really makes a lot of sense for them from that standpoint, but they could use the upgrade on their offensive line, no doubt about that. And so, you know, maybe Trent's the kind of guy that pushes them over the top, but it's hard to really say where he goes. You know, everyone's throwing out these random teams and these random packages, but like someone today, I was on Twitter and someone um, added me and said, hey, what about New England? They've got like 98 and 100. And I'm thinking, why the hell would the New England Patriots want to trade for Trent Williams? Like, they're not, and, and I, I don't know where Bill Belichick's mind is. I don't anticipate them being in win now mode. And I most certainly know that the Patriots aren't trying to pay Trent Williams the deal he's looking for. So, you know, the Patriots have never been one to spend a ton of money uh, in the first place on guys. And for them to trade for someone and then break them off with a massive deal, 
it, it's definitely not in their mo to go out and trade for Trent Williams and then break him off with a massive deal. I just don't see that happening. If Tom Brady were still there, maybe it makes sense. But if you're going to try out Jarrett Stidham next year, I don't know if Trent Williams makes a ton of sense for the Patriots. So I think they'd be better off. And don't forget, they drafted Isaiah Wynn a couple of years ago. I don't know how they feel about him at left tackle, if that's even a thing anymore for them. But I know he's dealt with some injuries there. But at the end of the day, um, they would probably more so go the route of the draft than, you know, spend that kind of draft capital and money on Trent Williams. So it's just hard to really say what ultimately happens with that situation. I think resolution is on the horizon, though. I don't anticipate Trent uh, suiting up for the burgundy and gold this year, but um, it's hard to say where he actually will go. So um, thank you for the super chat, uh, Tristan. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, got another super chat, this one from my man, Vincent Coe. Thank you for the super chat, Vincent Coe. Greatly appreciate it. My man, Vincent Coe, writes, Hey, Lou, thoughts on Isaiah Wilson from Georgia? I'll tell you exactly where I have him rated um, on my list of tackles. He's rated number 11. Um, he, is ex he is extremely raw, Vincent. I, I mean, super duper raw. Honestly, and I, I never like telling guys what they should or shouldn't do. I don't know what your situation is, you know, but he would have been better off going back to school if you ask me. He's extremely raw. He's big, man. Another one of these massive tackles. You're talking 6'6". Six, six. You're talking 300 and damn near 60 pounds. And this guy's a mammoth of a, of a tackle. He was their right tackle, obviously, Andrew Thomas was their left tackle, but um, you're talking about a guy with 35 and a half inch arms. Um, but when I look at him, he, he's just got a lot of things to clean up in his game. I think he would have been better served getting another year of seasoning at Georgia. Uh, he struggles with balance. Um, there, are, uh, He finds the ground a ton. And there's a lot of times where his his nose are over, you know, he, he extends out. And so... Um, his nose are, is way out in front of his toes and he's off balance and any swipe, any kind of physical contact knocks him to the ground. Um, I also have in my notes, his feet can get stuck in the mud. He's a big guy. It's 6'6", 350. So when his weight gets unevenly distributed um, and let's say he gets too much weight on that back leg and he's too far outside, anything inside and he's beat. Now, he does have long limbs. That helps him with the recovery process, and that saves him sometimes. But there's a lot of things that I think he's got to clean up. Quick inside moves give him trouble because of what I just mentioned, you know, that weight uh, unevenly distributed and um, his feet getting kind of getting stuck in the mud. I just feel like there's a lot of things he's got to clean up. Um, but, you know, you can't teach 6'6", six, six, you can't teach 350, uh, and so while I say all of those things, he's still intriguing and I'm pretty sure coaches out there are salivating to get their hands on him. Uh, I've got a fourth round grade, I believe on him. Uh, I got a late day two. So late, uh, day two is third round to early day three, which is the fourth round. So, um, that's my range for him with these tackles. A lot of times though, give him a little spike up. So, most likely, he's going to either be, and again, all of this beauty is in the eye of the beholder. In the draft, at every position, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We could poll 20 people. We could all sit in front of a television and watch the same prospect, and all 20 of us could have different opinions on one prospect. The same guy, we're watching the same tape and have 20 different opinions. So um, you may love him. You may think this guy can come in and start for you right away. I, however, think he needs a lot of work. To me, he is a third or fourth round pick at best at this point. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. Um, so those are all the Super Chats um, as of right now. So we will get to the phone lines. And we just missed a call, but I will now hit the comment section and uh, until we get a call or another super chat. 
Uh, Tracy Cooper says, we need Adam Troutman at 66. He may be there. You know, he very well may be there at 66 for the Redskins to select. Um, I think you're going to see a run on tight ends in the second round. He may be one of them. He may not be one of them. You know, you may only see two or three tight ends come off the board. And, and when I say a run of, on tight ends, that run may not come until the end of the second round, which could bleed into the third round. And right there, uh, Adam Troutman could be sitting there for the Redskins to select at 66 if he's their cup of tea. So um, at some point, though, I think you're going to see multiple tight ends in succession. You know, maybe a pick apart from each other or two or three picks later, another tight end comes off the board and then another two or three picks and another tight end. Once that top gets popped on the tight end position, I think you're going to see teams scrambling to go get theirs. But if nobody touches them, I think they're going to continue to go after other positions to make sure they don't miss out on those positions. And then once somebody grabs one, other teams may say, all right, all right, let's go get ours before they're all gone. So uh, thank you for that comment. Tracy Cooper got another super chat. So I'm going to take that. Uh, my man, Double A. First of all, Double A, um, hope you are doing well. I know you told me that you had contracted the Rona and that, you know, it was a little rough period for you there, but you were better. Hopefully everything is cleared up and you have no symptoms and you're feeling great. I'm glad to see that you're on this chat, which probably means you're feeling a lot better, man. My prayers were out to you. Just know I was praying for you and I'm glad to see you on this chat. But uh, thank you for the super chat, Double A. Greatly appreciate you. My man, Aldean Atkins writes, finally got over COVID-19. So look at that. Hadn't even read the comment yet. And um, you, you addressed that right away. Thank you for letting us know how you were doing, man, because I was definitely worried about you. He says, finally got over COVID-19. Talk to me about Nate uh, Mutai. Thanks for all the comment. Skull, like the video, fam. All right, so I will give you um, a quick little uh, comment. It's obviously, big guy, strong guy out of Fresno. Um, now, to me... He is more of, and a lot of times you see this with Samoan players, big physical specimens. They kill it on the bench. And I remember at um, the Combine when they were talking about the guys with the best reps, he was up there, 44 reps um, at the Combine. And you see it on tape. You know, he's a guy that is physical in the run game, but he's not a great athlete. Uh, he's a guy that can get beat on the inside. Uh, but again, to me, he fits much better in a man blocking scheme more so than a zone run blocking scheme. I don't think he's a guy that you want getting to reach blocks and things of that nature. But when you're talking about man on man, mano y mano, physical in a phone booth, he's a brawler in those types of situations and he's physical. So I think that's where his calling card is going to be, a guy that's going to give you some 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 things in the run game um but he's had some injuries so that's something else to consider and i i tend to try to stay away from those types of guys that have struggled with injuries in college because generally if you can't stay healthy in college it's only going to get more tough it's going to get more rigorous and more physical guys are stronger guys are faster uh it, it just comes at you a, a lot harder and so uh, guys with injuries at the collegiate level, which is why I'm a little nervous about Tua, I tend to try to shy away, shy, shy away from those guys. They make me a little nervous. He's another one of those guys that have dealt with some injuries throughout his career. But uh, he's intriguing, nonetheless. He's either, he's either going to be really good or he's going to be potentially out of the league in three or four years. And, and so it, whether that's due to injuries or poor play or what may have you, um, he could hit it big, and he could be a, a really good guard in this league, a quality, serviceable starting guard, or he could stink. And so we'll see what happens with him. But once again, um, thank you for the super chat. Got another super chat. Um, this one from my man, Protex Sports, my man, Tones. Thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate it. Um, my man, Tone, writes... O.J. Howard, fourth and fifth rounders for Trent. Your thoughts. 
Um, again, with Trent, it's going to be interesting because how do the Redskins value the player that you would be getting? Does that make up for the fact that you're not getting a second or a third round pick? You know, obviously you you tossed in, a, you know, a fourth and a fifth um, along with O.J. Howard. I, I, to me, that would be enough if you value O.J. Howard. If you don't value O.J. Howard, then then that deal obviously doesn't work. So it, it all depends on how the Redskins view O.J. Howard. Me personally, um, O.J. Howard is a really quality football player that fits a, a glaring need for the Redskins. Uh, and he's still got multiple years left on his rookie deal. And I think he's a guy that fits in the timetable that Ron Rivera and this Redskins staff and organization is moving towards with, with this youth movement. And so everything would ch- make sense. He checks all the boxes. He's another Bama guy. He works hard. I've heard nothing but good things about O.J. Howard. So uh, I-, I wouldn't have a problem with that deal. You know, the, the-, the fourth and fifth rounders, uh, would, wouldn't be the centerpiece of that deal, O.J. Howard would. But, again, uh, would the, the Buccaneers be willing to do that deal? That's the question. Um, and, and do they have the kind of space necessary? Is Trent willing to pay, play for the $12.5 million elsewhere? Or is he stuck on looking to get a new deal with guaranteed money? I assume wherever he goes, he wants guaranteed money. Are the Buccaneers in a position to give him that? Again, these are the things you have to consider. And, and this is why it's so tough because all as Redskins fans, a lot of times all we do is look at it from the Redskins standpoint. You also have to make it make sense for the team, the other team that's involved because it takes two to tango. It can't just make sense for the Redskins. You know, O.J. Howard makes a ton of sense for us. The fourth and fifth rounders make a ton of sense for us. But guess what? Does getting Trent Williams um, with one year left on his deal, wanting a new contract and guaranteed money, does that make sense for Tampa Bay right now? After they just gave Tom Brady essentially $50 million, two years, $50 million on a deal that probably is going to end up being worth $60 million, does that make a ton of sense for them? I don't know. if they and they, re, they, they got a guy on a franchise tag in Shaq Barrett. They re-signed JPP. I don't know if they have a ton of money. To disperse, uh, and so I don't know if that makes sense for them or not. Um, but thank you for the super chat, Protect Sports. Um, Vincent Cole, uh, double up, uh, uh, for my man Vincent Cole. Thank you for the super chat, Vincent Cole, my man. Vince writes, "Hey Lou, can you pick a tackle best fits the Seahawks?" Absolutely. Um, going through my list of tackles. The Seahawks have always been a team that likes athletically gifted tackles. You look at Russell Okun, who they drafted early uh, back in like the 2000 and I want to say 10 draft. That was the same draft that Trent Williams was in. Um, Athletically gifted tackle. Not as athletically gifted as Trent Williams, but still an athletically gifted tackle. Um, You look at uh, the guy that they just lost in free agency that went and got a deal from the Jets. Uh, that used to be a basketball player. Um, I, his name escapes me, uh, but uh, they got some quality snaps out of him, uh, George Fant. And so uh, you, you're probably talking about a guy like that. And there's several of those in this draft. Now, it depends on where the Seahawks are looking to spend um, draft capital to acquire this tackle. If you're looking first round, back into the first round, I think Tristan Wilfs, Worth will still be there. You know, he's athletically gifted. Josh Jones is another guy very athletically gifted. Both of those guys, to me, Josh Jones fits in Seattle. So does um, Tristan Wirfs. Um, to me, though, the guy that would make the most sense, I really like him. Now, here's the question with him. Lucas Nyang out of TCU. Um, this guy is stupid athletically gifted. Now, Here's the thing about Lucas Niang. Which Lucas Niang are you getting? Are you getting the Lucas Niang from 2018 that knocked my socks off? Okay. Or the Lucas Niang that I saw in 2019 that put on weight and not in a good way. And looked sluggish and looked like a guy that was struggling with the added weight. 
Um, and then and, and then subsequently got hurt and missed the back end of the season. If you're getting the 28, the 2018 version of Lucas Niang is in my top seven. That's how good he was in 2018. You watch him against Ohio State, among other teams and, and other games in 2018, but that Ohio State game, ridiculous. He shut down Boza before he got injured in that game. He shut down Chase Young. He showed well in that game. He popped out of his stance. He knew that was a money-making opportunity, and he did not disappoint. But then you watch him in 2019, and, and you know what was crazy. Let me read you my notes because <laughs> my notes, I started in 2018 with them, and I took notes, and then I got to 2019, and the notes that I took for 2018 <laughs> were contradicted like hell. So I put down in my notes, long body type that can add more mass. I got excited about this guy. And I said, excellent snap out of his stance into his kick slide that gets fantastic depth. And I'm excited about this dude, right? High IQ. He sees flashes of color and reacts to it. So if he's pinching down and then a blitzer comes off the edge, he'll go because he's doubling this guy and pinching down and then come off and get a piece of that blitzer on the outside and give the quarterback enough time to get rid of the football. Does a lot of good things. And then you get to 2019 and I said, looked sluggish and much heavier in 2019, and it showed. He was top-heavy, I put in my notes. And you could see he had this bulge at his stomach where you could tell he added on weight to get stronger, maybe a little bit more physical um, in the bull rush game, a little bit core stronger, and, and, and strengthen up his core. And he, he struggled because of it. He was slower out of his stance. He was slower to get to the second level. And this was a guy that I was excited about. Um, then he had the injury uh, to his, his hip. Tore his labrum in his hip, missed the final five games of the season. That's a problem. And now you can't really figure out how healthy he is because, you know, with all of the, the Rona going on and, and shutting down facilities, you can't test him and, and get physicals on him to make sure that everything checks out the way that you need it to. But, um, and he's another one of these guys, not really that much of a nasty disposition, but Lucas Niang is to me the quintessential Seattle Seahawks offensive tackle. The guy that I look at and I say to myself, Seattle Seahawks, I see Lucas Niang as that. Now, again, got to check some boxes. How's the hip after the torn labrum? All right, how's your weight? I need you back in 2018 shape. You get that Lucas Niang, you're getting yourself a steal in this draft. So um, I got Lucas Niang, and I think I have him as a third round uh, grade. 2018 Lucas Niang is a second round pick. All right, um, 2019 Lucas Niang with the hip I issue is a third, fourth round prospect. So it'll be interesting to see how all of that shakes out. But anyhow, thank you for the super chat, Vincent Co. Uh, greatly appreciate it. SLJ James, um, thank you for the super chat. Greatly appreciate it. SLJ James, SLJ writes, Rank your top five uh, tackles um, in this draft one through five. Um, I, I've already done that, uh, and it's scrolling across the top of the screen, but I, I'll do it for you uh, again. Makai Becton out of Louisville is my number one tackle, um, or Louisville, as they like to say. Uh, he's my number one tackle in this draft. My number two tackle is Dredrick Wills Jr. out of Alabama. He's a technician. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, he plays at his pace, and you can't speed him up. Uh, he's like a point guard that's a maestro, um, like a Steve Nash. Like Steve Nash always played the game at his pace. You couldn't speed him up. He was going to do what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it, and that's Dredrick Wills Jr. to me. Andrew Tom Thomas is my third tackle in this draft out of Georgia. Uh, a really good tackle, um, and really – he hasn't done anything wrong, per se. He's, they're just guys that are just flat out better than him. And uh, that's saying a lot because he's a really good tackle uh, in his own right. Tristan Wirfs out of Iowa is my fourth tackle. Um, not the road grader that we've come to know and love out of Iowa. Not the guy that's going to scoop you and dump you on your neck. But um, he's a guy that's an athletically gifted uh, tackle that has some more growing to do. But when you look at his frame and the way he's proportioned, man, he's built for tough. Uh, I mean, for, for a guy that 
played basketball and, and wrestled and did all of these things, it translates to the field. And so, um, uh, like Tristan Wirfs, he's my number four tackle. And my number five tackle is Josh Jones out of Houston. I love his frame as well. And I think he could actually stand to put on more mass on his frame. He's got a tall, long frame that I think you can put more mass on, uh, but athletically gifted, climbs to the second level with ease, um, does some damage um, in his pass sets, does, does a good job of mirroring, and um, he, he's got shorter arms than you would like at the tackle position, and he doesn't generate a ton of movement in the run game, but he does his job. And so uh, I like Josh Jones a lot. He rounds out my top five tackles in this draft. So um, thank you for the super chat. Um, next super chat from Timothy Wells. Thank you for the super chat, Timothy Wells. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, my man, Timothy writes, Lou, Harrison Bryant, FAU, straight legit. Have you watched his tape? Super underrated thoughts. P.S. Sprinkle me. Sprinkle me, bitch. Sprinkle me. Uh, yes, I watched Harrison Bryant, and I talked about him already. I can go in depth. I'll read you my scouting report on Harrison Bryant out of Florida Atlantic. Um, he, to me, my comp for him is Tyler Eifert, okay? Super talented, does everything that you're looking for. But um, here's my scouting report quickly. Uh, he's got size, he's got athleticism, easy, fluid mover, solid route running ability, sells fates well, uh, physicality with the, with the ball in his hands, yards after contact. He had tremendous production at Florida Atlantic. He's got tremendous upside because of all the things I just mentioned. He competes as a blocker. So you get you run through the full spectrum, the full gamut with him uh, from that standpoint. But here are the things that knocks him down a few pegs and a few rungs in my book, which is why he checks in at number four on my list of tight ends. Too many concentration drops. For a guy that had so many targets in college, for a guy that had so many catches in, in college, this is a guy that had over 1,000 yards receiving in 2019 at Florida Atlantic, okay? Uh, and, and did a lot of good things. But he dropped the football way too many times. And, and these were easy catches. He didn't have to go outside of his frame for these. Easy catches, and he just dropped the football. And for a guy that's supposed to, his MO is supposed to be catching, this is the, this is the Mackey Award winner here we're talking about. For the best tight end in the nation. Nobody's sleeping on this dude. You don't win the John Mackey Award and get slept on. So we know what this guy's capable of, and yet you're dropping the football too much for me. Ball's hitting the ground way too often for a guy with your talent set and your skill set. So uh, often use flexed or detached from the, from the box. You know, that's not that big of a deal in today's NFL where teams are looking for mismatches. He fits right in with that deal. But also, if I'm going to draft you relatively high, I need you to do some of everything. You know, the best tight ends in the league, you know why everyone loves George Kittle right now and why he's one of the favorite tight ends in the league of everyone? Because he blocks his ass off in line as a Y, okay? You can detach George Kittle and he'll bust your ass running the slant. You know, but he can line up just as good a as the Y right next to the tackle and kill you on a seam route or run a corner route and smoke your ass. All right. Harrison Bryant ran a 4.73. George Kittle ran a 4.52. They're not the same. And oh, by the way, um, George Kittle is mauling dudes in the run game. Harrison Bryant not doing that. Now he competes. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty. I like that, and he can get better, but um, he's detached so often that I think it's going to take him some time to get used to sticking his hand in the dirt and being more of a Y tight end at the next level. Not to say that him being detached as a U and being used as a move piece around the, the, the formation isn't also going to add value to his stock, because it is, but... Uh, I think teams are looking for a guy that can do it all. I think that's why you saw uh, TJ Hawkinson go so early because TJ could block. He was, excuse me, physical in the run game, but TJ was lining up in tight, physical, at the point of attack, but also could run routes, separate, catch the football, that kind of thing. And you don't really see that from Harrison Bryant. And then finally, we'll have to learn how to separate at the next level. He doesn't separate all that well. His separation comes in his size. 
at 6'5", 243. And um, he doesn't have the, the, the long arms you would like. 31-inch arms isn't short, but for a 6'5 guy, you were hoping that they'd be 33-inch arms. They're not, but that's fine, okay? He separated at the collegiate level more so off of uh, people just losing him, him running to, to open space, him sitting down in zone, or him running a seam route, nobody running with him in zone coverage, and him running wide open on busted coverage, or um, him being having somebody right on his hip, but him just little broing them and saying, you too small, man, back up, and him using his body as a shield. So, um, and, and he was under-recruited, in high school due to him being an offensive tackle at high school and then making the switch to tight end in the senior year. And so he went kind of under-recruited, and that's how he ended up at Florida Atlantic. So Harrison Bryant is a guy that is, I don't think is being slept on. I think that he just has some things that he needs to work on, and if he's able to clean some of those things up, he's got a chance to be really good. Remember, Tyler Eifert burst onto the scene. He's one of my favorite Notre Dame Fighting Irish tight ends. He burst onto the NFL landscape and looked like he had a very promising future before the injuries took effect. If Harrison Bryant is anything like Tyler Eifert, that guy could be a steal for someone in the 2020 NFL draft. So um, thank you for the super chat, Timothy Wells. Um, got another super chat. This one from Samer L. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, for my man, Samer L. Greatly appreciate it, Samer writes thoughts on Josiah Deguar late pick decent tight end in my opinion I absolutely love Josiah Deguar out of Cincinnati I'll tell you where he's rated um, on my list of tight ends I've got him as my number nine ranked tight end ahead of Thaddeus Moss so that gives you um, uh, uh, some perspective on how I feel about Josiah Deguar man I really like this kid uh, 47240. We saw him at the combine. I told you that's when he jumped on my radar. Remember, I had no idea who Josiah DeGuara was before the combine, but I told you he was one of my top performers uh, in Indy. And it was because of his performance there that I was like, man, I've got some tape to watch on Josiah DeGuara because he was so impressive. And that I did. And uh, man, I like him. I've got right now a day three. Um, uh, grade on him, a fourth, fifth round selection, um, somewhere in there. My comp for him is Owen Daniels. Um, I see him as a guy, you remember, Owen Daniels had a very productive NFL career, about eight, nine years in the league, caught a bunch of touchdowns from various quarterbacks, Matt Schaub, Peyton Manning. Um, uh, those are uh, among the list of quarterbacks that he did damage with in this league. And uh, as a matter of fact, Owen Daniels caught – uh, Peyton Manning's final NFL touchdown, if you can believe that, in the AFC Championship game back in 2015. So um, Josiah DeGuar is uh, a guy that I really like. I'll give you uh, my breakdown of him quickly. Moves well, can threaten a seam and even get vertical on over routes. Has a good feel for zones and where to sit down and make himself available. Competes as a blocker. Physicality with the ball in his hands, yards after contact. I love his ability to catch the football in traffic. There are a couple of times his quarterback forced it to him, and he just he, he made the quarterback right. That's what I love about guys that can catch the football with their hands is that you can have an errant pass or you can try to squeeze it in there with coverage, and guys that can truly catch the football will make the quarterback right. He's able to do that. He runs solid routes. I was actually really pleasantly surprised at how well he ran some routes to separate. He had some really good production. Uh, seven touchdown grabs for Cincinnati last year. So he's getting it done in the red zone, which is really where you want to see your tight ends shine. And then he plays with uh, this edge and, and this energy and this fire that I love. Uh, contrasting a guy that I hated his energy, Bryson Hopkins, he was like a corpse on the field at times. I can't have guys like that on my team. Bryson Hopkins, there was one play that just rubbed me the wrong way. And he had a teammate make a catch. And his teammate is fighting his ass off. Two defenders on his back. He's trying to drag him for the first down. And he's a half yard short. And it's third down. I think it might have been second down. I, I don't. Let me not put extra sauce on it. I think it was second down. But Bryson Hopkins is standing right there watching his teammate struggle fighting for that extra half a yard to get the first, 
and he does nothing. He didn't go help him. He didn't try to push the pile. He does nothing. His teammate ultimately doesn't get the first down. I said, dude, what are you doing? Like, you can't just stand there and watch a teammate struggle. Go do something. Go help. And Josiah DeGuar is one of those guys that he, he plays with his hair on fire, man. I love it, man. He, he wants to block. I saw him block a dude out of bounds, and he was jacked. You know, I watched him make a kickout block on a screen, and it popped for like 30 yards, and he's pumped. He, he didn't make the catch. He made a block, but he was pumped. Like, he, I, I just, I really like Josiah DeGuar. Now, the weaknesses. Um, not ideal size or um, the length that you're looking for from the typical NFL tight end. Eh, that's hogwash. But, you know, 6'2", 242, that's not going to knock your socks off. You know, you're in the Aaron Hernandez territory when you start talking about that kind of size. You know, in, in today's NFL, you're looking for the Zach Ertz. You're looking for the George Kittle. You're looking for the um, Travis Kelsey, the 6'5", the 6'6", guy, the massive size guy that even if he's not able to separate with quickness, he separates with size. The Gronk, you know, the big physical hulking guy that, look, I can just throw it up to him and he'll make me right because he's so big. Uh, he's not that guy. Uh, can become a better blocker. I, I think he, he he competes as a blocker, but I think he needs to get better in that department. And um, I also put in my notes, I'd like to see him make the quarterback right uh, a little bit more. And what I mean by that is catching the football outside of your frame. Um, he does catch the football in traffic very well. But if he's got to go up for the ball, if he's got to go low for the football, there are a couple of low throws on some slants that I thought he could have caught. Wasn't, wasn't great throws by any stretch of the imagination. But um, to me, the, the separation in the league with pass catchers is how do you make your QB right? On third and five, you, you got the first down on the slant, but he makes a, a, a poor throw low down on the ground and you got to go dig it out. Are you going to make that catch or are you going to let it slip through the wickets and now you got to punt? Those are the guys that separate from me, you know? Um, and so, but I, I really love, and then I put this down in my notes. This is the last thing on Josiah DeGuar, and we'll move on. Tremen <clears throat> excuse me. Tremendous hustle play versus UCLA after an interception. Um, he runs down the DB 60 yards down the field and makes the tackle. That, that was a pick six. And Josiah DeGuar comes, and this is what I'm talking about, the energy, the fire that he plays with. Out of nowhere comes Josiah DeGuar 60 yards down the field on what was going to be a 100-yard pick six, and he makes a tackle. And they, if I'm not mistaken, they ultimately get no points out of that possession. That's a big time right there. Love Josiah DeGuar. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Samer L. Um, got another super chat. This one from Chris uh, Zacharias. Thank you for the super chat, Chris. Really appreciate it. My man Chris writes, predict which tight end and offensive tackle the Redskins will draft. Uh, impossible. All right, impossible to predict what, what the Redskins are going to do, where they're going to decide to spend draft capital at those two positions. Um, but I tell you what I will do is um, I will be able to present that to you when I give you my Redskins seven-round mock draft. Uh, at some point, I'm going to have to make a prediction there and what I think the Redskins are ultimately going to do, how I think the draft is ultimately going to play out. And, and that's the kind of thing you got to take into consideration because I could give you a list of tight ends and tackles that I believe are going to be on the board in the third round. Redskins have two fourth round picks at the time of those selections. And, you know, and, and, and the draft could go in a totally different direction. I mean, I sat here last year and told anybody that would listen that Kelvin Harmon is a second round. Uh, potentially, he might fall to the third round pick. Kelvin Harmon didn't go to the sixth round, okay? So we sit here, we put these rounds, and we put these numbers on players, and teams have a totally different view of these players and, and what they can be in their scheme and their system. And so we have absolutely no idea how the Redskins feel about any of these players, and we don't know how the rest of the draft is going to take place and, and how it's going to fall and how the board is going to kind of shape out. And so... Um, it, it's going to be extremely tough to project where these tight ends come off the board, where how many tackles come off in the first round and how many come off in the second and what's actually left for the Redskins come the third round at 66 if they're still uh, looking for one at that point or have they you know, changed and set their sights on a different position that gives them more value. The draft is all about value. Uh, I've talked about that numerous times, so... 
I know that's not the answer you're looking for, uh, but I, I can do you this solid. I can give you some names of some guys that are going to be available um, in the third and potentially in the fourth round at both the tight end and tackle positions. Um, so at the tight end position, uh, Hunter Bryant may be available, the tight end out of Washington. Honestly, we could start with Harrison Bryant out of Florida Atlantic. I think he could still be available at 66. Highly unlikely, but not out of the realm of possibility. Hunter Bryant is where I think you really start to see uh, these tight ends be available in the third round. Uh, Kobe Parkinson will be available in the third round. Albert O will be available in the third round and probably the fourth round as well. Bryson Hopkins uh, will be available in the third, more likely fourth, possibly even the fifth round. Josiah DeGuara, who I just mentioned, will be available in the third and the fourth round when the Redskins have two selections. Uh, Thaddeus Moss will be available third, fourth, possibly into the fifth round. Jared Pickney, another tight end out of Vanderbilt, who I have listed as my number 11 tight end. He'll be available well into the mid-rounds, fourth, fifth, possibly even the sixth round. And Dalton Keene out of Virginia Tech, who I have rated as my 12th tight end. He's a late-round selection. He's more of an H-back, a move piece. Uh, he'll be available well into the later rounds if the Redskins decide to uh, address tight end potentially at the back end of the draft. Then you get to the tackle position. Um, and I think this is a lot harder to project because you could easily see Anywhere from you know, four to six tackles go in the first round. I think it continues in the second round, and you see another three or four go there. Then I think it cools off a bit, and then you could see it pick up in you know the, the late third, early fourth, into the fifth round. But um, I think you get down the list quite a bit. Maybe Ezra Cleveland is available in the third round. I doubt it out of Boise. Austin Jackson, I think, is going to be long gone. Lucas Niang is interesting, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but the medical has to check out for him. And you got to know which Lucas Niang you're getting. Obviously, you can get him to cut the weight. If you want the 2018 Lucas Niang, you're just going to have to tell him, look, bro, you're going to have to lose that weight. And and I'm pretty sure he won't have any issues with that. Sadiq Charles is the guy that I kind of targeted as a potential guy for the Redskins. Now, here's the thing. Rivera's trying to build a culture. This is a guy that was suspended for six games. Uh, by LSU in 2019. And so uh, what's the deal there? You know, if, if I'm the Redskins, I've got to dig, or any team for that matter, I've got to dig deep into why the hell they saw fit for you to miss damn near half the season uh, because of violations. So I need to know what the hell that was for. Um, usually you're not missing six games for smoking weed. So what's going on? I need to know something. So um, I need to know what's going on with that. Uh, he's extremely raw. Uh, only played the offensive line for two years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but this is a guy that has some talent, man. And he's really athletic. Uh, he'll be around in the third round, I believe. Um, uh, Prince Tega Winogo out of uh, Auburn is a guy that I think will be around uh, potentially in the third round. He will not be there in the fourth, I don't think. Um, I've got a third round grade on him, but you know, beauty again, in the eye of the beholder, I'm not a huge Prince Tega Winago fan. So, um, I, I, I don't rate him as high as others, but someone else could look at him and think this guy is a second round prospect all day long, all day strong. And he could be gone in the second round. He could go over some of the guys that I've rated. He could, he probably will go before Ezra Cleveland. He probably will be right around that Austin Jackson range. I have him behind all of those guys. So um, it'll be interesting to see where Prince actually lands. Isaiah Wilson is another guy that I'm not too fond of. But again, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I see a raw, big prospect that needs a ton of work. Someone else may say a, a big slab of clay that I want to work with. So um, all of these guys will be available, uh, as I mentioned. And then Robert Hunt, who I actually see more as a guard prospect than a tackle out of Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, rounds out all the guys that will be available third round and uh, further in the draft, most likely. So um, I know you were looking for a specific name or two, but uh, that's the best I could do for you right now. Um, let me get to the next comment. 
Uh, it's from my man, Double A. Uh, double up. Uh, uh, from my man, Double A, Aldine Atkins. Thank you once again for the super chat, Double A. Greatly appreciate it, my man, Double A writes. Talk some Ben Barch, um, Minnesota boy, double skull. Um, so, small school guy. Um, I watched a couple games for, from him, and I, I, I haven't done enough homework on him. Here's why. Because when you watch him um, playing, it's so it's such low level football. So, and honestly, I didn't feel like he dominated thoroughly enough. Like normally, when you're playing against that level of competition, I want you throwing guys out the bar. All right. Uh, I remember it was a couple of years ago. Now I think when the Buccaneers drafted uh, the guard slash center prospect out of that small school, I forgot his name, man, and I forgot the school he went to. But uh, he was throwing dudes out the bar. That's that's kind of what I'm looking for. Pure domination. All right, you, you playing low-level football, dominate. That's all I can ask of you. I didn't feel like he truly dominated. That being said, um, I want to see how he performed because he was the only Division Three player invited to the Senior Bowl. I've got the Senior Bowl um, on my DVR right now. I have not watched. He's one of the guys that I'm, I'm specifically going to go and watch the Senior Bowl to see how he actually fared in that game when the competition level was raised. Um, but I can tell you this, he's got shorter arms. I saw that as a problem. I'm not one of these people that really harp on the short arms thing, like spare me, okay? I, there are plenty of guys that have had shorter arms that have went on and had successful careers. Joe Thomas, most notably with shorter arms, first ballot, surefire Hall of Famer. I think another guy that's gonna ultimately be a Hall of Famer is Jason Peters. He was a guy with shorter arms. So the short arms narrative is not one that I push very heavily unless, unless I see it as a problem, then I bring it up. With him, I saw it as a problem because I saw guys getting into his chest. And as a small school prospect, I don't want to see guys getting into your chest. I want to see you locking out and extending those arms and keeping guys at bay. I want to see you punching these guys, knocking them off balance, off kilter, all right, knocking off their equilibrium and dumping guys on their neck. And he did a little bit of that. But there were also some guys that got the best of him, that were able to get in his chest and bull rush him, that were able to give him some problems. And so I want to watch Ben at the Senior Bowl and see how he fared against um, more competition as he starts to climb up different levels of competition. How does he handle that um that transition from D3 to now you're playing against D1 athletes to now you're going to be playing with the big boys in the NFL. I want to see how he fared at the senior bowl. So um, thank you for the super chat, double A. Um, Trevor Patch with the super chat. Thank you for the super chat, Trevor Patch. My man Trevor writes, just supporting HTTR. Thank you for the super chat, Trevor Patch. Thank you for the support. Greatly appreciate it, Trevor. Um, got another super chat. This one from NJ33. Greatly appreciate the super chat, NJ33. NJ33 writes, thoughts on Tyler Johnson for Ron's plan. We talked wide receivers last week, uh, but Tyler Johnson um, is a solid wide receiver that um, I saw make plays. At Minnesota, I can. I think I've got my wide receiver notes close enough by me that I can uh, give you a quick rundown on him. Let me see if I can pull it really quickly. Um, Tyler Johnson is my. He is my 14th rated wide receiver. Uh, he did not run a 40 at the combine. He chose not to, which is always a red flag for me when you're healthy and you're able-bodied. I've got him pegged as a 4-5-3 uh, uh, to a 4-5-8 40 guy, which isn't terrible. It's just not ideal, uh, especially for someone for his size. You'd like him to be a lot faster at 6-1-2-0-6, but whatever. Um, huge production at Minnesota, um, and you got to love that. You know, 86 catches, 1,318 yards and 13 touchdowns in 13 games. This is monster numbers. Um, I've got him as a third-round pick 
Um, and I comped him to Tyler Boyd, the ex pit wide receiver, who's really starting to hit his stride in Cincinnati. They just gave him a new deal with the Bengals uh, last year. And so um, I think he's got that kind of ability at the next level as a potential number two wide receiver in this league. I don't see him as a number one. Um, got size, toughness, catching traffic, hands, versatility. He can play in a slot or outside. They moved him around at Minnesota. Um, he was able to, to get behind defenses. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to do that consistently at the next level. Uh, but his production was off the charts and through the roof. Um, and he can high point the football. I'd like to see him be a little better at that, as a matter of fact. Uh, his weakness is I've got speed. Did not run a 40 at the combine. So I'm not sure if he's able to take the top off the defense or not. Um, I put down in my notes, Gophers use stack releases in motion to avoid press coverage. Is that an issue that I need to be concerned about? That they knew he wasn't going to be good at getting off of press release. So instead of putting him in a vulnerable position, they use motions and stack um, stack um, formations to uh, get releases for him off the line of scrimmage. Um, is that something I need to be concerned about? Or is that just their game plan and that's how... Looks like we had a little bit of uh, technical difficulties there. Hopefully everything's good now and we're reconnected. But um, And then I also had when he's one-on-one, -on -one, he consistently, can he consistently separate? Which I'm not sure he can. So, um, and I also put in my notes here, versus Iowa, tough contested catches, which were, were, were great, but also dropped a crucial fourth and four in the game down 20 to 13 in the red zone on a slant. He dropped it, would have had the first down, might have even scored, probably wouldn't have, but it would have been a first down and goal from probably inside the, the seven-yard line, and he dropped it. That's not big-time football. Uh, and they lost that game, by the way. So late in the ball game, fourth and four, they go to their big-time receiver. Big-time players make big-time plays in big-time spots. He didn't do that. So uh, that was a big demerit for me there as well. But as I've said before, uh, this is not a receiver show. But because you super chatted, uh, I blessed you with that. But we did receivers last week. Thank you for the super chat, NJ33. Timothy Wells coming back for more, if I'm not mistaken. This is a triple for you. I'm going to uh, double up, uh, uh, just in case it's a double up. But I'm going to triple up too because I'm not quite sure at this point. But thank you for the super chat. It, it, whatever the case may be, Timothy Wells, who writes, Lou, me again, one last question. Do we go tight end or Claypool at, in the third round if we don't get Trent to hit the bricks? Love your game. Sprinkle me, bitch. Sprinkle me. All right. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if Chase Claypool is there. You know, those kinds of height, weight, speed specimens, they go fast, man. Okay. Teams go goo goo gaga over speed. Now, a guy, and, and I comped him to uh, the Notre Dame wide receiver that came out last year, uh, that similar size, sim exact same 40 time, he went in the third round. So, Claypool most likely will be there, more likely than not. I don't know what the Redskins are looking to do. Uh, it's interesting because what position do they value more? at 66 you know and i've talked about value being the big key well what do they value the most tight end wide receiver cornerback safety left tackle like what do they feel like they're getting the most bang for their pick at 66 and again hard to say right now because we don't know how the draft board is going to shake out and we don't know what their draft board looks like because they could have a second round grade on Chase Claypool. They get to the top of the third round and they say, man, we can't believe he's still here. Let's go ahead and take him. Or they could say to themselves, man, um, we thought that uh, Cole Komet was a, a, a fringe first round pick at the tight end position. We love his game. We think we can develop him as a blocker. But the things he does in the, in the past game, you can't teach. We need this kid. We thought he was a, a fringe first rounder. Here we are at 66 with a chance to take them. That's great value. Let's take them. So it's hard to say what the Redskins are going to do. I surmise that whatever is done 
I think it's going to be an offensive player, personally. Whatever the Redskins decide to do at 66, I think it's going to be on the offensive side of the football. Whether it's a receiver, a tight end, or a left tackle, I think it's going to be on the offensive side of the ball. I would be shocked if it's a backer or a safety or a corner, unless it's just too much value to pass up. I just don't see anything on the defensive side of the football trumping some of the offensive needs and the value that will probably be there at those specific positions. I, 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 that's the best I can give you at this point is I think it's going to be one of three positions, tight end, offensive tackle, or wide receiver. And we'll see what the Redskins ultimately decide to do. Um, thank you for the super chat, Timothy Wells. All right. Um, that was the last super chat. And we'll get to the comment section. Oh, we got a call. You're on live with your man, Louis T. Who am I speaking with? Hey, what's going on, Louis? It's JP. How you doing? What's up, JP? What's going on? Um, I didn't get to call into your Redskins show last night, so I'm a little disappointed by that, but I'm here now. Talk to me. All right, so since this is a tight end and offensive tackle show, um, obviously those are two big needs for the Redskins. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if Dwayne Haskins is good, if Dwayne Haskins is going to be the starting quarterback for us in 2020 and beyond, we need a replacement for Trent Williams. Mm -hmm. That's pretty obvious. He's not going to be with us anymore. Um, man, I would have really loved it if one of these, if maybe one of these guys like Tom, like Andrew Thomas fell in the draft, but I don't think that's possible. Mm -hmm. So I've got a few names. Um, a couple of them are, are interior guards. The other one's a tackle. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, Trey Adams, Washington. Mm -hmm. John Simpson, uh, offensive guard of Clemson. Mm -hmm. And Nick Harris, offensive guard of Washington. Mm -hmm. Nick Harris, I love him. He's more of a center, though. I think that's what teams see him as. Um, I think he's going to be really good at the next level. It, I wouldn't be shocked if he went in the second round, similar to last year when we saw the Saints and the Packers, I think, in back-to-back -back picks go uh, centers um, last year. Um, it wouldn't shock me if someone reached up and snatched Harris early. Um, again, <clears throat> there are other guys that – you know, offer you more versatility. Harris can probably play all three interior positions. Um, uh, who were the other ones you mentioned? Um, the other guy is um, Otto, Trey Adams, offensive tackle Adam Otto is, Washington. Yeah, he's, he's interesting because he's had some injury issues. Um, he's big, he's long. Um, not as athletic as you would like him to be, but I think the, the big question with him is probably going to be the medical on him. And then uh, I think you mentioned the guard from Clemson. John, John Simpson, Clemson. Yes. Um, I, I like him a lot as well. Um, I've got him anywhere from the mid-second round to the early stages of the third. Um, I just think he's one of those plug-and-play type of guards. You know, one of those guys can play either guard position and uh, gives you a little bit of flexibility there and uh, does everything good, nothing great. Uh, I just think he's a really quality offensive guard. I don't think there are any elite guards in this draft class per se. Uh, none of those guys like a Zach Martin or someone like that where you take in the first round. But, um, but you know, again, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, I wouldn't be shocked to see somebody like a Simpson go late first round, to be honest with you. But, again, as I've always said, there aren't 64 first-round picks, so I think he's a guy that ends up going in the second round. Yeah, I like Simpson a lot. Um, I had him and Trey Adams mocked in a few mock drafts mm -hmm. that I made. Mm -hmm. um, they, they'll be the Redskins. They interviewed this guy out of LSU, Sadiq Charles. Yep. I think he could go. I'm not sure what round he's going to go. I'm going to. I'm assuming maybe fourth, mm -hmm. uh, maybe fifth. Mm -hmm. um, where do you, if we do get him, do you like? First of all, do you like him, and where do you think he'll? And where do you think he'll start? Well, he was a left tackle at LSU, um, but he played all over the line. I actually like Sadiq Charles more than I thought I was going to um, when I watched him. He's a little um, erratic, you know. He's a little herky jerky. Um, he's raw, but 
there's a lot to work with with him. And I love the fact that he's so athletically gifted. And I love the fact that I got to watch him against some of the uh, elite talents in college football. And it didn't hurt that he got a, got to go up against, you know, one of the better pass rushers in all of college football every day in practice. So um, I, I like him. He's got shorter arms than you would like to see him have. Um, and I, I'll read you my, my breakdown of him real quick. Um, athleticism, good knee bend. Climbs to the second level with ease, recovers extremely well, which saves his life because he loses initially a ton because he's so raw. Uh, but he's got the athleticism to recover. He, I love his awareness, uh, which you generally don't get with guys with limited starting experience. This is a guy that had 28 starts um, and 26 at left tackle, one at right tackle, one at right guard. But um, he reacts to color really well. So uh, he might be pinching inside on, a, on a, a blitzing backer, and then they may be sending a safety hot late on a delay, and he'll peel off of the, the linebacker or he'll peel off that defensive end and go and get a piece of that blitzing safety. And um, I, I, didn't th- I didn't expect that from him. That was pretty, um, pretty good on his part. He's got really good upside. He's only been playing offensive line for four years. So... Uh, he's really raw. When you watch him, you see that he's raw, but you see the potential as well. Um, and he battles versus the bull rushes. It, it's not always the cleanest. Sometimes it'll force the quarterback to you know, panic a bit because he feels like the pocket is kind of collapsing, but he usually hunkers down, stops the guy from getting to the quarterback. You get to his weaknesses, though. He's impatient with his hands. This is the thing that drives me nuts with Sadiq Charles. He is so impatient with his hands that it actually forces him to lunge, which puts him off balance. And then he's all out of whack. And at that point now, he's vulnerable. You slap his arms down at that point, and he goes flying all over the place, and you got him beat. Um, he, 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 uh, he's also susceptible, and I was shocked by this because he's so athletically gifted. He's susceptible to the inside move. I watched him versus Auburn and, and Big Cat Bryant. He spun on him two plays in a row, and he beat him both times. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, he just got you on the snap before with a spin, so you can't let him do it again. And he put him in the spin cycle again, and he beat him cleanly. So that's something he's got to clean up there. Uh, and then, you know, when you talk about him just being raw, his footwork, his hand placement, his balance, his base, all of those things are out of whack. So when you look at him, and then you throw on the suspension piece, missing six games due to suspension, there's a lot there to digest with Sadiq Charles, but if you're talking about potentially getting a steal uh, as a left tackle in the fourth, third, four, I got him as a third round pick. I got him as a, a, a third to an early day three, which is a fourth round pick. So somewhere in there, I think someone's going to take a chance on Sadiq Charles. And he's got a chance to be a starting NFL tackle. Left, right. To me, he's got left tackle traits, but he doesn't have left tackle um, size. He's he's six four. You generally want your tackle to be six five, six six. I'm nitpicking, and you generally want your tackle to have thirty four and a half inch arms or longer. He's got thirty three inch arms, so um, that's something else to take into consideration with Sadiq Charles. Yeah, yeah. He played for my LSU Tigers for a few years. I watched him. He's a good. He's excellent. Um, I would not be surprised if this guy gets picked at sixty six. Um, he. I watched him. I watched that whole off- LSU offensive line against Auburn. They really, really struggled though to block um, Derek Brown, who I know you're probably going to break down with the, when you do the defensive mm-hmm. line video. Um, I would like either either of the offensive linemen I just mentioned. I would love to get to select. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the tight end, look, we need a tight end. <laughs> we really do. Jordan Reed's done. Vernon Davis done. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeremy Sprinkle, sprinkle me, bitch. <laughs> sprinkle me. It's not exactly the long term answer. He's solid. Mm-hmm. Come on, I'm looking for a so- I'm looking for a quality tight end. I, as I mentioned earlier in the show, Albert O. Mm-hmm. Albert O. Mm-hmm. Um, I would really like a pick 66 mm-hmm. if he's there. I'm assuming, like, early on, I didn't think this guy was going to be. A lot of people didn't think this guy was going to be on the board at pick 66 um, because some had him going into some some. Boards had him going in the second round. Um, either Albert O, um, Adam Troutman, 
Hunter Bryant, but I would really like to snag up Zach Moss mm-hmm. maybe in the fourth or fifth round. He's going to be there in the fourth. But he, listen, either one of these guys, I would really like a tight end. For me, I would really like Moss the most. Yeah. Um, I know you're an LSU guy, so um, it, 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 he'll he'll be there, man. He'll he'll def- I think the Redskins will have multiple cracks at Thaddeus Moss. Um, so we'll see if they like him. We'll know we'll know if they like him or not because they'll have opportunities to pick him for sure. Hey, thanks, JP, man. Really appreciate you as always. Hey, hey thank you, man. I appreciate it. Yep. Um, man, I hope the Redskins draft Devin Asiasi. I really like him a lot. I don't think he's going to be there, though. I think he's one of the first tight ends off the board, honestly. I think the more teams watch tape on Devin Asiasi, I think the more they fall in love with his game, and I think the more likely it is he's one of the first tight ends selected in this draft. I think Cole Komet, Devin Asiasi, um, to me, are the two guys that have a chance to be uh, number one, and and I th- like I said, I threw in Adam Troutman as well. Uh, I think his upside is through the roof. You know, it, it, small school guy, so obviously you want to see how he uh, transitions to the NFL. The four eight didn't help him. I, I thought he was going to run a lot faster than that. Same thing with um, Harrison Bryant. I thought he was going to run faster than what he did, and neither one of those guys tested all that great. The four seven three he ran wasn't terrible, but you know, you watch him on tape and you're thinking, man, this guy's probably going to run a four six six. No, he ran a 4.73, and, and Adam Trotman, I'm thinking he's going to run a 4.73, and no, he runs a 4.8. So um, we'll see what happens. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, where these tight ends actually go. Uh, got another call, so I'm going ahead and take it. Oh, missed the call. So we'll get back to the comment section and see if there's anything there. And... Uh, Um, let's see. Niners fan says, how come Andrew Thomas fell down draft board so much? I thought he was a bona fide top five pick. I, 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 it's funny you asked that. I addressed that earlier. Someone asked that question. My, I think it was my man JP, as a matter of fact, asked that question. Um, so I've already answered that, but it, he didn't do anything wrong. It's just that other prospects are better than him, period. It, it it's not an indictment on Andrew Thomas as much as it is, man, you know, we found better options, you know, like little Caesars pizza is cool. And if I'm hungry and I want a hot and ready and I can go in and get it and come back out, that's great. But I'd much rather have pizza hut. I'd much rather have Domino's. Hell, I'd even take Papa John's and I don't even like Papa John's over Little Caesars. And and that's essentially what happened is that, you know, Little Caesars is cool, man. I mean, seriously, give me some ranch dressing and I'd knock back a few Little Caesars slices. But guess what? <laughs> you give me the option of Pizza Hut or Domino's or something, I'm like, you know what? I'll go with one of those guys. They're a little bit better. And that's essentially what happened to... To Andrew Thomas, he's not bad. He's a good football player. There's just better options available. Simply put. Um, got a call. Going to go ahead and take it. You're on live with your man, Louis T. Who am I speaking with? Hey, what's up, man? It's Tracy Cooper calling, man. What's going on, Tracy? Appreciate the super chat earlier, too. Yeah, you know what, man? Um, I just wanted to, you know, uh, I was sitting here looking at the highlights after I saw your, uh, your tight end list. Mm-hmm. Um, where did Asiati come from for you to put him that high? Because mm-hmm. I'm not seeing him on like no other top five or ten tight end rankings at all. Mm-hmm. He. What is it about him? He is. He's a, he's a really well put together tight end man. Um, he does everything really well. Um, watch him. Watch him versus USC. You watch him versus USC. And then you come back and tell me he can't play at the next level at a, at a high level, okay? Um, that was the game that did it for me. And I watched him in about three games, three or four games. But that was the one that put him over the top for me and, and made him that high. He, to me, like I said, Thaddeus Moss has the best set of hands at the tight end position in this draft. 
But after him, I think it's a close second between Kobe Parkinson of Stanford and Devin Asiasi at UCLA. And when you watch him, he's fluid. He runs good routes. He snatches the ball out of the air. Um, he can run. And, and in that USC game, um, they needed a big play. They throw him a slant, and he runs away from everybody. Um, and there aren't many guys in this draft doing that. And and then he run. He can he can block. Like he's not. Like I said, none of these guys are excellent blockers. There are a couple of guys that stand out. You know, Thaddeus Moss actually blocks. Devin Asiasi competes in the in the in the run game as a blocker. Man, there's a lot to like with him. And so um, I, I'm telling you right now, when the draft gets here, he's going to be a name that you hear sooner rather than later. You may not see him. I don't know what list you're looking at, uh, but it doesn't matter. I'm telling you, when teams watch him on tape, they're going to realize this guy can play at the next level. And no, he doesn't have, he's not 6'5", you know, and, and, you know, teams might fall in love with that kind of stuff. Just give me the guy that can ball. And I, I look at Devin Asiasi and I see a baller. There's a, a lot of what I'm seeing is like pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's like basically Cole Komet. Mm -hmm. And you got like Bryson Hopkins mm -hmm. and Adam Troutman. It's like um, the one I'm getting from those guys is not like plug and play starters. It's kind of what, what I think we need. Like mm -hmm. I think we need a guy that's going to, you know, make his presence felt all training camp if we have training camp mm -hmm. and, you know, just hit the ground running and I'm, I'm maybe I'm not seeing that mm -hmm. or or I don't know what it is but the only guy I'm seeing that from is like maybe Hunter Bryant he's the only one I see like you can move around and, and he uses just a flat out like weapon yeah like but he, he didn't block with, like, he didn't block at all Mets and the Parkinson and yeah. all those guys I'm, I'm getting like tight end two vibes from most of these guys yeah and you know what and, and, and that's why I said there, there is no first round tight end in this draft there isn't a Noah Fant or a TJ Hawkinson in this draft. Um, there, there's just a bunch of guys that you have to project. You you want plug and play? You may not get that in this draft. And, and, and one of these or two of these guys may ultimately end up being plug and play. But I, I don't know if you're going to get a baller right out of the gate. But you've got to also draft for the future. And you got to draft these guys off of a projection as well. And all of the guys you named, with the exception of maybe Bryson Hopkins, who I'm not the biggest fan of, um, all of those guys have talent, man. And they've got their areas that they've got to improve upon. But Cole Komet could step in and play right away. His issue is blocking. Um, but he can step in right away. Go watch him versus Georgia. And that's a big-time SEC team on the road, and he ate them up. First game of, his first game of the season, ate them alive. Over 100 yards receiving in that game. So, Cole Komet can do it. You know, and, and you watch some of these other guys. Hunter Bryant, he can do it, but he doesn't block anybody. So, um, you know, every all of these guys have their faults. You just, you know, get, you'd rather deal with the, the, the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Okay, last thing, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and let someone else call in. Uh, what, this, this, I don't know what it is, man. Tell me why I'm so in love with Albert O, man. That's all I need, bro. <laughs> okay. Albert O is polarizing because he, he can run. Who else in this draft is running 4-4-9 at the tight end position? Let me answer that. He ran a 4-4? 4-4-9 at the combine. Oh, man. Okay. He, he can run. But Albert O doesn't run any routes. You know, when you watch him. He only him, had like 500 yards, right? Yeah, but you can't put all it like, you can't just look at the numbers with these guys. Uh, a lot of times you got to take their situation into consideration he, he had a, a brand new quarterback, uh, Kelly, Kelly Bryant, transferred from Clemson to um, Missouri. Okay. Kelly Bryant stinks. And um, so, you know, it, it changes your dynamic there. He had Drew Lott. When he had Drew Lott two years ago, he looked like he was going to be right. a first-round pick. <laughs> yep. You know, so, you know, all of that stuff is circumstances. But then what you got to also take into consideration is – you just look at him and you say, man, this guy's a beast. Like two, three years ago, he had like 13 touchdowns. And then you start digging into the tape and you watch him and you start finding holes in his game. And um, I think that's why you see a guy like Albert O kind of just, you know, down the, the, the board a bit. Like I think he's my eighth, my seventh tight end, as a matter of fact. I know yeah. he's my seventh for sure. Um, yeah, he had him at seven. 
Yeah. So if you can have any one of these tight ends at 66, where you going? Oh, I would take Adam Troutman. Um, yeah, me too. He, I think me too. Or, or Cole Komet. I yeah, guess. I would take Cole Komet, Adam Troutman. I don't think you could go wrong with either one of those guys. And I told you I would take Devin Asiasi as well. If, if you told me I had my pick of the litter, I'd go Troutman because he's so damn big. Um, and there's a lot you could do with that. And he's shown the ability to go get the football. And I love that because we don't have a lot of big options on our football team at this moment. So you tell me you're giving me a 6'5 tight end in the red zone that I could throw it up to. And I'm, I'm all for it. You know, and I think he competes in the run game. I, I told you, I think his upside, if he maxes out his potential, he's Travis Kelsey. That's saying a lot. Yeah, that's saying a hell of a lot. So uh, I'd take Troutman. But if um, Troutman was gone, Komet was gone, I, you know, I'd take Devin Asiasi in a heartbeat. So. All right. Well, appreciate chopping it up with you, man. Ain't no Enjoy doubt, Trace. Bro. You have a good one, bro. All right. All right. Um, make sure... We don't have any more super super chats, and we don't. Um, we got four minutes left, and then we'll hit the eleven o'clock mark, and I will glide to the side at that point. So let me either run through some comments quickly, and if we get a call, I might take a call. But I'm gonna run through some comments real quick. Um, let's see. <laughs> Iron Rain, it says, I'm focused on Louis T and his hate for my Falcons uniforms. Yeah, they, they were trash, bro. Uh, I stated my case already, especially especially the one that bleeds, that starts red, bleeds to black, into the black pants. You got to get the hell out of here with that. That shit is horrendous. Nike needs to be slapped for that. Um, anyway, got to call him and go ahead and take it. You're, you're on live with your man, Louis T. Who am I speaking with? I'm wondering. I'm wondering who, what, um, what offensive tackle do you um see falling in this year's draft? Um, it, it uh, falling is such a vague term because it depends on where you felt like a guy was supposed to go and then where they ultimately go. I mean, a guy could be a top fifteen projected tackle and then end up going in the second round. That's technically falling. Um, if you mean falling in terms of, you know, maybe first round, fringe first round talent ends up going in the third round, ta- that generally doesn't happen with tackles, man. Like, unless you end up having some kind of injury or some kind of off the field issue that we don't really know about until the draft, Tackles don't really fall. If you've if you've got left tackle or even hell, it's left or right at this point, because Jedrick Wills Jr. is a right tackle and he could be the first tackle off the board. If you can play tackle, it's almost like having a big in the NBA. If you can chew chew bubble gum and walk at the same time, and you're over six ten, you're gonna have a, a chance to play in the NBA. Um, same thing with tackles. If you got the size and the length that they're looking for and you can play, they're going to they're gonna draft you relatively high. So I don't know if there's going to be many guys that drop. But like Ezra Cleveland for me is a guy that I think has second round potential. But I could see him being a third round pick. So if that you can if you consider that falling, sure, that could happen. I hear you, man. Also, I know this is a little bit off topic, but what do you think about that cornerback Lamar Jackson? Um, big, big corner from Nebraska. Um, I I don't, I don't really love him, you know, per se. He's physical at the line of scrimmage, but he has to be because he doesn't have the long distance speed to keep up with receivers. So he's got to disrupt them early in the route. If he's not able to get his hands on them, guys are able to run by him. But, um, it, it, it just all depends on the scheme. He's really one of, like, he'd fit perfectly in Seattle. You know, big corner, long arms. Now, I don't know if Seattle's even doing that anymore because last time I checked, Seattle was playing man-to-man. But, you know, if you're playing cover three or you're playing cover two, you're pressing at the line of scrimmage, um, eyes on a quarterback, key in quarterback's eyes, I think he'd, he'd excel in, in a scheme like that. And, you know, Ron Rivera is a cover three guy. So, you know, that could be someone that the Redskins kind of target, you know, late portion of the draft, you know, if he's available. Thanks, Lou. Keep doing what you're doing. Love the show. Mm -hmm. Stay safe, man. Likewise, man. Take care.
Take care, man. Yep. And on that note, uh, I am going to glide to the side. I thank you guys for joining me on this show, Draft 101 Live. Um, next week, we will slide to the defensive side of the football. We'll look at the defensive line. We'll look at edge rushers. That's going to be a lot of fun because there's some good guys in this draft. Um, it's top-heavy, though. You know, after you get past the first seven or eight prospects, I think there's a precipitous drop-off in the level of talent. And then you got to start finding guys that you might be able to develop. But uh, nonetheless, there's some talent at the top portion of this draft. Um, a lot of guys that can play some ball, man. And so looking forward to breaking that down next week as we get to the defensive line and edge rushers. Should be a ton of fun. I'm your man, Louis T, signing off. Remember, if it's not your man, T, it's not. I repeat, not the best NFL coverage it could be. Look for a podcast tomorrow. I, I feel like dropping a pod. I got a lot of stuff to do. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit it in, but I'm I'm going to make it my mission to try and put out a podcast tomorrow. So look for the pod. Make sure you like this video. Subscribe to the Louis T Network for more great content. I'm um, looking forward to chopping it up with you guys. Uh, there was a trade in the NFL. I don't think I'm going to do a video on it. Uh, uh, Brandon Cooks um, goes to the Houston Texans in exchange for a second rounder in this year's draft and a fourth rounder. And get this, 2022. All right. So we're going NBA now. We're, we're trading picks in drafts to be named later. Okay. But that's what happens when you're the Houston Texans and you've traded away just about all your draft capital. And I know I say that and they probably got 87 picks in this year's draft. But my goodness, a 2020 second, fourth round pick. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and Brandon Cooks, he's one concussion away from being out of the league. And can he stay on a team for more than two years? My goodness. Jesus. This guy has been traded so many damn times, it's not even funny. Anyway, that's going to do it for me. I thank you guys for joining me. You guys take care. Stay safe as always. Take all precautionary measures possible. And we will reconvene here shortly, whether it's next week, this weekend, if something big were to take place, or on the podcast. Look forward to doing that, and hopefully you guys will check that out. Until next time, I'm Louis T. You guys, have a good one. Louis T. Yeah.